Hello and welcome to this video about the use of flumazenil in the treatment of hepatic encephalopathy. This video is brought to you by the Video Journal Club, a YouTube channel which is meant to hopefully spark discussion about truly fascinating medical literature. Uh, so with those things said, let's go ahead and get into the topic. Now, I'm super excited to share this particular video with you. This is one of those things that I've absolutely loved to read about. And the literature on this topic, it's, it's not particularly extensive. There's not a whole lot out there, but what is out there uh, is truly fascinating. So I hope to walk you through those things. And I, I really hope to go into this video with you being as excited about this topic as I am. So for that reason, I want to kick things off uh, with a story. And the setting for our story uh, is Austria in the late 1980s. And the subject is this wonderful case report by, done by Peter Ferenczi and colleagues about the successful long-term treatment of a portal systemic encephalopathy, what we call now hepatic encephalopathy, by the benzodiazepine antagonist flumazenil. So the subject of our case report is a 42-year-old previously healthy female who presented to the emergency department with abdominal pain. She was ultimately found to have a large right upper quadrant palpable mass that necessitated exploratory surgery. On laparotomy, it was found that she had a large extensive tumor. It originated from the gallbladder. It infiltrated all over the abdomen into the right lobe of the liver, the porta hepatis, the transverse colon, head of the pancreas, the duodenum. It was a truly extensive disease. She underwent this uh, complicated operation that involved many things, but in part, and, and what's most interesting to our conversation, uh, liver resection and the construction of a portal cable shunt. Now, everything that happened to this patient thereafter is complicated and interesting, and I absolutely encourage you to read the case report in its entirety on your own. But here, I just wanna highlight some of the most incredible details and the details that I feel are most relevant to the conversation that I wanna have moving forward. So about six weeks after her initial operation, she began to develop severe, debilitating hepatic encephalopathy. She was treated with a regimen which is actually remarkably similar to the current standard of care. She got daily lactulose. Uh, she was treated with neomycin, an oral antibiotic, which has predominantly been replaced by rifaximin today, but nevertheless, she was treated with an oral antibiotic. Uh, she was given supplementary branched chain amino acids, which even in much more recent studies have shown to have true benefit in uh, severe refractory encephalopathy. And she was also placed on a protein-restricted diet. This is a little bit more controversial today uh, for long-term maintenance of hepatic encephalopathy, but it is still employed uh, in the short term for relief of, again, severe refractory encephalopathy like this patient truly had. And despite all of these treatments, uh, she had no improvement whatsoever. And her condition was actually such that she was comatose for 12 different times within a period of only two years. After failure of standard therapy, this patient was given a one milligram IV dose of flumazenil, after which she immediately awoke from a comatose state and remained awake and alert for a period of two hours. Because of this, the team that was taking care of her elected to begin a 25 milligram oral dose of flumazenil each morning. And they uptitrated that over a period of two weeks uh, and eventually were maintaining her on a 25 milligram BID dosing regimen of oral flumazenil. And she did great. She had no evidence of hepatic encephalopathy and significant, significant improvement in her quality of life. And then, as if that wasn't crazy enough, a few months later, they stopped the flumazenil briefly for reasons that I won't get into here in the interest of time, but once they stopped the flumazenil, her horrible encephalopathy almost immediately returned, and it didn't go away again until they restarted the flumazenil at the dosing regimen that they had been providing her before. So hopefully after that introduction, we can agree that this is a super cool topic, and it's absolutely worthy of further exploration. And that's really what the rest of this video is going to be about. And so here's my outline for the rest of this talk. First, I want to start with who Maisonil. And that's my lame sort of weirdo way of saying, you know, what is this drug and what does it actually do? Second, we're going to talk about, you know, sounds great in practice, but how is it in theory? And this is my fun little academic way of asking, why would this drug even work? 
And why would anybody have thought to look at it in the first place? And lastly, the good stuff. And of course, when I say the good stuff, I'm referring to the data. You know, we've seen this sexy story of these heroes who came in and they saved the day with their coma eradicating elixir, right? But how did that actually hold up in bigger trials and larger groups of patients? So what is flumazenil? You know, I don't think that it's a drug that's going to be new or mysterious to anybody in medical practice or medical training. Uh, it's something that we learn about in medical school. It's a competitive antagonist of the benzodiazepine receptor site on the GABA-A receptor. Um, primarily, nowadays, it's used in benzodiazepine overdose. But honestly, even this use is falling out of favor um, because it doesn't reliably reverse the respiratory depression seen in benzodiazepine overdose. And the short-lived effects seen with IV administration of this medication, they, they make resedation very common, uh, especially in people who are taking high dose or longer lasting uh, benzodiazepines. Um, and and so, so really it's, it's a drug that's not used that often at all in clinical practice today. Uh, side effects of the medication, there are several mild short-lived side effects. I've listed them here, things like nausea, vomiting, uh, vertigo, anxiety, and these occur in about somewhere around 10% of patients. Um, there's also this black box warning for increased seizure risk. And you know, I, I sort of think that it's a little bit silly to consider this to be a side effect of the medication when in reality, it seems like a perfectly predictable consequence of the treatment, given that this drug works by directly antagonizing the effects of some of our first line abortive medications for when patients are having seizures. Uh, and a very similar thing can actually be said about anxiety. You know, we use benzodiazepines to treat anxiety attacks. So anyway, this is a little bit of a digression, but I, I mainly mention it because honestly, given this mechanism of action, frankly, I, I think that it's more shocking how infrequently these patients develop seizures. There was a 2015 safety-driven meta-analysis that showed that out of nearly 500 patients receiving flumazenil, uh, only three developed seizures, uh, which is a rate of less than 1%. Um, so overall, you know, this is a drug that's been around since 1981. It's been FDA approved since the early 1990s in the United States. And presently, it's only available as a generic. So uh, it's not a particularly costly medication. And overall, looking at the side effects and the rates of their occurrence, it's actually a pretty safe medication. You know, one of the great things about the potential for using flumazenil and hepatic encephalopathy is that it has an underlying mechanism which has true pathophysiologic basis. And that's something that's just remarkable in clinical practice. You know, there's a lot of drugs that we use empirically and we really don't know how they're working exactly, but the data is just so compelling that it works that we're convinced that it's appropriate to use. But when we think about things in terms of pre-test probabilities, if we have a drug that pathophysiologically has reason to work, and then we have some evidence supporting its use, we're a lot more likely to believe that evidence, you know? And so I, I, I really like that this does have pathophysiologic basis. And I realize that that statement initially doesn't seem intuitive because when people talk about the mechanism of hepatic encephalopathy, it's often blamed strictly on decreased hepatic clearance of ammonia. You know, that's a classic teaching. But I think it's been recently well established and, and widely accepted by the medical community that ammonia just isn't the full story. Arterial ammonia concentrations, they just don't perfectly correlate with the degree of encephalopathy. And, and this, of course, implies two things. It implies that, one, ammonia, as we all know, isn't a particularly useful diagnostic or prognostic tool in the general cirrhotic patient when working up encephalopathy. And also, it implies that hepatic encephalopathy must have a mechanism that is, at least in part, independent of, um, of ammonia. And the reality is that hepatic encephalopathy, it's a complex phenomenon, which, like most things in medicine, is, of course, you know, quote-unquote, not yet fully understood. I, I think that we hear that about almost everything that anybody ever discusses in medicine. But in the case of hepatic encephalopathy, you know, it really is true. There's a lot that we still don't know about it and how it works. Um, now, one of the major complements to the so-called ammonia hypothesis uh, that initially came out of animal models and has subsequently been strongly supported by human data is uh, what's 
often referred to as the GABAergic hypothesis. And these two hypotheses are actually complementary to one another. So briefly, you know, GABA is a, a largely inhibitory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. Benzodiazepines are inhibitors of receptors for GABA. And benzodiazepine toxicity in many ways can mimic hepatic encephalopathy. So that got researchers interested in looking into it a little bit further. And, and there's now, you know, by now there's evidence in both human and animal studies that those with hepatic encephalopathy have both upregulation of GABA receptors and elevated serum levels of ligands that bind to those receptors. So altogether, when we talk about using flumazenil on hepatic encephalopathy, what we're talking about is a drug that's both inexpensive and safe, and it has pathophysiologic data that are supporting its use, and it also has case reports that support its use. So naturally, it's been investigated in a number of small randomized controlled trials. And in this case, the data for the use of flumazenil on hepatic encephalopathy is actually relatively quick and easy to go through because uh, the people at Cochrane did a systematic review of the available literature in 2017, and, and really nothing too big has come out on the topic since then. So what this is is a long and comprehensive review of the available literature, and, and it's, it's really quite interesting. But one of the things that they did was they chose to focus on a primary endpoint of mortality when comparing flumazenil to placebo. And it's evident by looking at the summary chart of the data here that they could not demonstrate a mortality benefit of flumazenil when treating hepatic encephalopathy. So admittedly, that's a bit of a bummer, right? But there are a couple of major issues with the use of mortality endpoint here. And these are actually issues that are beyond the usual problems that come along with attempting to show a mortality benefit in the intensive care unit, which most of these patients, by the way, involved in these studies were admitted to an intensive care unit. They're critically ill people with uh, primarily high level encephalopathy. And, you know, here's the thing. Hepatic encephalopathy is undoubtedly a devastating condition. All of, of all of the horrific complications of advanced liver disease, it's often noted that this is the complication that patients fear the most. But by itself, it, it isn't usually deadly, right? You know, it, it's an independent predictor of mortality, yes. But we tend to think of hepatic encephalopathy like other metabolic encephalopathies, is being triggered by something else. Some of those things can be deadly, but the encephalopathy itself isn't really the deadly part. So I'm not sure that using mortality really makes a lot of sense here as a primary endpoint. Furthermore, lactulose, which is considered the first-line therapy for treatment of hepatic encephalopathy, has never been demonstrated to show a mortality benefit. In patients. The only hepatic encephalopathy treatment that may possibly have a modest long-term benefit on mortality is rifaximin, and even that data is a little bit shaky. And it's also an outrageously expensive medication, and practically it's only used as an add-on treatment for lactulose. So, you know, the mortality benefit isn't even compelling enough to make it the first-line treatment despite its cost. So, I think this is actually a really good time in the presentation for me to digress for a moment and talk specifically about lactulose for a little bit. You know, lactulose, it, it, it's a treatment for hepatic encephalopathy, but what it is is a disgusting, syrupy, non-absorbable disaccharide that makes you feel like you're going to throw up, but instead you poop your pants. Just the other day, I was talking to a patient who suffers from decompensated cirrhosis, and, and she said that taking her lactulose is the worst thing about her disease. The only thing that's worse than taking the lactulose for her is the fear of hepatic encephalopathy. You know, keep in mind that this is a patient who's underwent paracentesis multiple times for tense societies. This is a patient who's had banding for bleeding esophageal varices on multiple occasions. But she hates the lactulose so much. And she hates it because once she takes it, it can lead to unpredictable bowel movements. And she, like many patients, is afraid to even leave her home for fear of fecal incontinence on lactulose. All of this is to say that this is a drug that's actually quite difficult to tolerate, and the evidence for its effectiveness as a whole is 
honestly surprisingly weak given its ubiquitous use in medical practice. I don't have a lot of time to go deep into the effectiveness or lack thereof of the first line medication for hepatic encephalopathy during this video. But I just wanted to take a moment to highlight that this is a difficult drug to tolerate and it's not 100% effective and it does not improve mortality. So alternative symptomatic therapies are desperately needed and, and that's really one of the reasons that I wanted to make this video specifically about flumazenil. So the last point here on the issues with the mortality as a primary endpoint, now that I've gone through my entire digression here, um, the last point is that, you know, during these studies, Lactulose was given at low doses for very brief time periods. Uh, in the largest of the trials, which actually makes up for most of the patients that are involved in the meta-analysis, flumazenil was given as a one-time, one milligram IV dose on top of the standard Lactulose dosing. So, Think about what that means. Altogether, this meta-analysis has just over 800 patients, and we're treating a condition which by itself doesn't really cause death in a patient population that is otherwise very ill for unrelated reasons. We're treating this condition with a single dose of an IV medication, which has actually a pretty short half-life. And then we're trying to use all-cause mortality as our primary endpoint. If this had worked out to demonstrate a mortality benefit, that would have been so shocking that honestly, I would have questioned the validity of it anyways. And for the record, it still sort of almost did. There was overall a 7.4% mortality in the treatment group versus a 9.3% mortality in the control group, a relative risk of about 0.75, and the confidence interval just barely crosses over one. So, you know, a mortality benefit would have been outrageous to think with given all the factors I've just discussed, but it actually almost was demonstrated in this trial, which is something very interesting to think about. All right, so perhaps mortality isn't the perfect endpoint to use here, right? And luckily, although they focus on the lack of mortality benefit in their ultimate recommendation against the use of flumazenil for the treatment of hepatic encephalopathy, they also looked at an outcome of overall beneficial effect on the degree of encephalopathy. And granted, the definitions for improvement were quite variable across the different trials. You know, they included several different clinical scales and psychometric tests and electrophysiologic variables that they used to determine whether or not somebody improved on treatment with flumazenil. And I understand that that makes for not a perfect systematic review and meta-analysis for this outcome. And so I kind of understand why they didn't choose this as their primary outcome to focus on. But, you know, they've tried to do with it the best that they can. They've essentially chosen to report the data loosely in, in binary terms as far as, you know, did patients improve or not improve with treatment with hepatic encephalopathy? So they made them a binary term, improve or not improve, um, comparing flumazenil versus standard care alone. And they were able to demonstrate, for what it's worth, a reduction in the degree of hepatic encephalopathy with flumazenil. Um, a relative risk of 0.75, confidence interval going from 0.7 to 0.8. And, you know, if you look at these trials individually, they all report a similar story to one another, wherein patients are given flumazenil, they rapidly recover, and the benefit persists anywhere, between, depending on the dosing and that sort of thing, anywhere from one to four hours. And this is sort of an encouraging effect, right? I mean, this, this actually does show that there's likely, by and large, the data supports the idea that there is a benefit in decreasing the level of encephalopathy that patients are suffering from when treated with flumazenil. All right, so now I want to just kind of wrap things up and share with you what my thoughts are on the appropriate use of flumazenil currently and what I think might be future directions for the use of flumazenil in the treatment of hepatic encephalopathy. So short-term use of flumazenil, much like other drugs used for hepatic encephalopathy, does not necessarily improve overall mortality. All right, and that, that's, that's well supported by the data. That's, I, I feel like that's a true statement. But there is modest evidence that flumazenil can be used for rapid-on, rapid-off symptomatic relief in hepatic encephalopathy. And 
Even in the most recent AASLD guidelines on hepatic encephalopathy from 2014, they actually mention flumazenil in their discussion. Their official stance is that it's a rarely used medication which transiently improves mental status without improving overall survival. And I agree with all of that. They also mention that it may have some applicability in quote unquote marginal situations, although in my experience, that transient recovery may be more valuable than it's given credit for. In the worst of outcomes from these trials, patients became significantly more alert for at least an hour, though oftentimes it lasted even longer than that. You know, just imagine with me for a minute, having an hour of clarity with a severely encephalopathic patient to ask them about their symptoms, get a good history of present illness, to talk to them about medication compliance, to talk with them about goals of care, to consent them for procedures. Just the possibilities are endless. There are so many things that you can do in just an hour. Or imagine another scenario. Imagine a critically ill patient who might otherwise spend their final moments with their families confused and lethargic. Instead, having an hour to coherently say goodbye. You know, my point here is that even if this effect is in fact transient, there is real potential benefit to that. And I think it's underutilized, I truly do. I believe that this is also a good time for me to mention that there was this recent letter to the editor published in the American Journal of Therapeutics in 2019, which highlighted a case report of the effective use of flumazenil for the short-term treatment of hepatic encephalopathy. In that report, they talk about an 88-year-old male uh, who presented with overt encephalopathy. He was initially treated with standard lactulose and rifaximin, and, and he didn't improve, much like the case report that we talked about earlier. He was then given just a 0.2 milligram dose of IV flumazenil, and he immediately aroused with marked improvement in his mental status, and it lasted for about an hour. They, once again in their discussion in this letter to the editor, they highlight the need for research on the use of this medication in hepatic encephalopathy. And, advo and they advocate for its use currently to be limited to facilitating bedside care and procedures and that sort of thing, which I think is a perfectly reasonable approach based on the currently available literature. But lastly, you know, I want to reflect back on our initial case that we talked about. If you recall, they did something that's different from what's done in all of these trials. You know, they actually put the patient on long-term oral flumazenil. You know, flumazenil, it has a poor oral bioavailability, right? So, so I don't even think that there are oral versions of this medication currently available on the market. But nevertheless, they were giving 25 milligrams twice daily. The bioavailability of flumazenil is about 16%, which means that they were effectively giving a four milligram IV dose to this patient twice a day. And no trial has ever investigated either IV therapy at doses that high or oral therapy in any capacity. So I would love to see oral flumazenil brought back and investigated for the purpose of long-term maintenance of hepatic encephalopathy. You know, I, I think that that's something that's not currently been investigated and, and, and really should. The potential for this practice, it, it's incredible. You know, I imagine a world where we have these lactulose sparing strategies for the prevention and treatment of hepatic encephalopathy. You know, a, a world where we have increased patient compliance since we have medications that aren't causing horrible side effects and likely even decreased cost. You know, lactulose has its own costs. Uh, Rifaximin certainly has its own costs. Uh, and flumazenil could be a cheap alternative that actually really works. Overall, I think that Flumazenil is an underappreciated. Flumazenil has both an underappreciated current role in the treatment of acute encephalopathy and a theoretical role in the prevention of chronic or relapsing hepatic encephalopathy. And I hope that it receives more attention in the upcoming years. You know, thank you for listening to this topic. And, you know, I, I really do appreciate anybody who comes across these videos and really takes a chance to listen to them. And, and I, I hope that you'll share with me what you think about this topic and, and 
what other ideas you have about the treatment of encephalopathy. I have another video that's upcoming about some other investigational therapies for treating hepatic encephalopathy because this is just uh, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And, you know, I hope that you'll tune in for those two. And, and I appreciate you 